for much of my Christian walk, uh, the Bible has felt more like a, a puzzle than a inspirational text. It's felt like uh, opening up a map and not knowing how to read a map at times, having some general idea of what the elements on a map are, like the key and north is up and those things, but um, really, and I don't, I don't say this lightly, but I, I I praise God for the faith that I had in the unknown Bible because the more time I spent learning not just the Bible but about how to approach the Bible, how do you handle the Bible, Um, the more I started to see the consistency in the message and the and the beauty in how it reveals to me who God is and who we are as his people and who I am as his person and the struggles that his people have and the grace of God that he brings and offers to us. Um, and I don't, I don't think I'm unique in that. I don't think anyone uh, was born understanding the Bible. Anyone? No? Good. So, we all, we all connect on that, right? At some point, the Bible is a mystery. And, and the more I study and the more I know, the more I realize how mysterious it is. And um, I think the thing that causes us a lot of confusion today is, is we, have, we don't have a clear lens through which we approach the Bible. And when we were developing this series... We were really cautious because we're in this whole year where we want to equip you on how to handle the Bible. And so we're going to kind of expose you to some of the Bible college terminology and how uh, theologians and historians approach this ancient text. Um, but we didn't want to get too granular because this is, we're, not, we're not trying to be a Bible college. But, so we weren't initially going to talk about this, but... The reaction that I've had from you as I've introduced some things uh, makes me realize, one, you can handle this, and two, it's really going to help clarify things, and, and uh, you're really going to understand where we're coming from. So when you hear something that is maybe new to you or shocking or out of the norm of what you expect, you'll understand the framework that we're putting it in. And I also realize we're in an age now where... Information is available to anyone to grab on to something and find some facts and then misapply it to something else and it sounds very compelling and it can threaten the foundation of our faith. And so I want to equip you with this framework and one of the most common um, confusions that can happen when you're looking at, uh, in, in the discourse of religion and theology and the Bible and ancient history. So that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to, so two things, two approaches to reading the Bible. Uh, one is called critical or sco- source scholarship. It's also called historical critical research. Um, any, any, any approach to the Bible that removes any religious framework. So you're just objectively, objectively analyzing the biblical text um, as it sits and stands and its place in history, how it compares with other, other myths and stories that we have in, in history of the same time and how it fits in the overall grand narrative of human history. Now, I'm not talking about the, the events that the book is writing about, we're talking about the writing, right? So, you know, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, which is where we are, was written, but we don't have any indicator, written at a time in a place, but we don't have any indicator of when the creation happened. We just have a time where we know it was written, right? Right? Everything is written after it happens. 
There's a joke there. Oh, every picture of me is an old picture of me. That was it. Okay. And so it's only looking at the text and what it says in relation to its place, its written place in history. So that critical scholarship happens from a, a you can come at that from a, uh, well, in its purest form, it comes at it from a non-theistic point of view. So the whole premise of this is it's not going to impose any theology on it. And so that's not completely unuseful, and it's, and, and in, so the other type of scholarship is theological or confessional scholarship, and that is when we have a theological framework, and we're reading the text and seeing the, the theological framework either challenged or confirmed, or we're learning new things about it, and, uh, and that is what we as Christians do. That's how we look at the Bible, this ancient text, as a devotional or as a place to get hope uh, because we read into it. So in the Old Testament, you have all this narrative, this repeated narrative of, of uh, you know, God's people. There's an expectation on God's people and they keep failing, but God builds redemption into the story and there's hope. There's a redeemer. So every time we read the Old Testament and we see the, the, the theme of sanctification or redemption or salvation or hope, or the end of suffering, or consequences for sin, right? We read Jesus into that because we've experienced those exact things, right? And so that is confessional study or scholarship. And that's what we do in the church as Christians, as pastors, that's what we do. More and more critical scholarship is becoming more public, right? And what I want to do is equip us with this understanding that critical scholarship is in no way a threat to our confessional theological scholarship. But sometimes we fear it. Sometimes when someone makes a statement that we think threatens our faith, we fear it, react, walk away, condemn someone, call them a heretic, and run away. But I want to encourage us to, let's look at this deeper. And the text I want to use first to show this is an interesting text. It's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You may have heard this before, um, but this is in context. Paul has written, written, write, written a letter to his disciple, Timothy, and he is just laying out this case for the role of Scripture in his ministry and in the community. And he comes to this point where he says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture is God-breathed, right? And the rest of it says, do you have 17? Yeah. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what is providing the equipping? The God-breathed scripture provides the equipping, right? And we as a church, our leadership, we exist, as Ephesians 4 says, to equip the saints for works of service. To do the things God's created you to do, we equip you. And that's the heart behind this whole series. We want to equip you in how to handle the Bible yourself. And so going back to verse 16, there's two key words here that I want to analyze. First... The way we understand this text, the way I understood this text, let's say, and, I, and it's very common in the initial understanding, is that means that God had his hand on the whole Bible through the Holy Spirit. The whole Bible was written with the Holy Spirit, and the idea of breathe, the imagery I always got was that the... Like it was almost like the Holy Spirit possessed the authors and guided the writing. So it's then we get this the inerrancy of Scripture because the Holy Spirit wrote it. But let's look at the the word is etymology, like the the word word history, the study of specific words of Scripture. And we don't have to think too far about this, but okay, Paul wrote this to Timothy at a time 
And when we hear scripture, what do we think? We think the Bible. Well, when Paul was writing this, what did he think? The New Testament didn't exist when Paul wrote this. And the entire, what we call the Old Testament, there were different variations of that with different books excluded, different ones included at the time. And it wasn't universally agreed upon by all the rabbis what the Jewish Bible was. And so for us, in our Western minds, we think something is something. So Scripture is a, is a specific thing, and it is God-breathed. Well, let's look at what Scripture is. Scripture, so, so since it can't mean the Bible, right, so what does it, what could it mean, what does it mean? Now, if you look at the word Scripture, uh, it, it reveals this intent of Paul as the author in saying, all godly truth. All truth that points to or leads to or reveals God. So all truth that reveals God is God-breathed. Now God-breathed, deonuma, means in the Greek, means uh, it infers life-giving, giving life, right? God breathed his spirit into, into man, right, and gave him life. Um, it's also used to say something's refreshing or enlightening or life, life-giving is really the implication. So, all truth that leads to God is life-giving. Now, that is a bigger umbrella than the Bible that we have today. But for sure, it includes the Bible. You see what I did there? And this is what I want to encourage us to do. When we hear someone challenge what we, we presume, we can go with it. And when we're reading our confessional or theological uh, scholarship into it, we realize the fact that the Bible is uh, spirit-filled and gives life and God-breathed, it's not just true it's truer than true it's it's deeper than the fear reaction that we have when someone starts to take apart these foundational things that we were taught or we believe and so we can still hold to our conviction that the bible is god breathed because in the intent of the word scriptures everything that points to god reveals god is life-giving Bible is exactly that. So we still hold on to our beliefs, but we don't have to fear that historical criticism. So we can lean into it, right? Because some people will use that verse and they'll go just that far to say, well, the New Testament wasn't scripture, so the Bible, throw the Bible out. And that's just an immature way to handle anything. Um, but now you have a framework to say, well, that is the critical source theory versus the confessional or theological theory that we who've been saved by Jesus, we look at it that way. Because we look at the Old Testament, and the Old Testament and these recurrent themes, every time the Old Testament says something about redemption, says something about sanctification, something about hope for the future, something about uh, the consequence of sin and the, uh, the per- God's pursuit of his people, We read all of this into the, when we read the Old Testament, we have experienced and we know that all those references are pointing to Jesus. Last week I said something, but I went long in my sermon, so I didn't get to wrap it up. So let me clarify something I said last week. I made a statement, and it was probably sloppily said, but I just said the Bible doesn't say anything. The authors of the Bible have written something to someone in a place, in a time, for a purpose, in a unique culture, and none of it is us. And so we can look at that and and get in the mind of, or as much as we can, what is the intent of the author and how does it apply to there? And what we see when we do that, we start to see 
Jesus in the whole text. But I would restate that to say the Bible, if, if you could say it says something, it says one thing. The entire Bible is pointing us to Jesus as our Savior. This narrative story in the Old Testament of, uh, we see it in Adam and Eve and we see it all through the nation of Israel of God's people. God puts them in the perfect land, this perfect place, and says, here you're gonna live here and, and there's rules because I created this place and I'm gonna show you the best way to thrive in this place. And if you don't do the best way to thrive, the world's, your world's going to fall apart because I designed it in a very specific way and I'm depending on you to, to, to keep it humming, to keep to steward, to take care. And, and so when we stray from that, our world starts to fall apart and God warns us, right? And so we have the prophecies. So we have this story of, day, of uh, Adam and Eve and in this little, little section of like 15 verses, we see this whole narrative play out. Adam and Eve do the one thing they're not supposed to do, and then God intervenes and provides salvation, which is the proto-evangelium, and we're going to get into that in a second, uh, Genesis 3.15. That story plays out over and over and over again in the Old Testament. God's people were given a land there were some things to work that land and, and steward that land and to be obedient to God and represent God and to, and to prosper and to be fruitful. And they did the thing they weren't supposed to do. And there were bad consequences. God warned them. God, sometimes God warned them through prophecy and, and they prayed and they repented and they came back. But then it's just a recurrent theme. And you and I don't have to look back more than a few days to realize that's me too. I'm the same pattern. And so as we, as we approach Scripture through this lens of this book is, I'm not just reading this book, this book is reading me. And we start to see this beautiful story about God's never-ending love for us that pursues us even when we sin and especially when we sin, we see it pronounced. So let's look at uh, Genesis 3.15. This is the proto-evangelion, which means first gospel. And what we're going to do is look at it with kind of this integrated critical scholarship and confessional scholarship approach. So through the critical eyes in this passage... This is the, um, the passage where, uh, oh, there it is. And this is, which is God speaking about the consequences of, his, of the sin or the temptation of the serpent. Um, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So I have heard some interpretations of this to say if you just look at it on its surface, it, uh, what is it, ideological? No, the ide ideological is when you just take the literal word and, and ascribe a meaning to it, right? They would say, that's why women are afraid of snakes. <laughs> I've heard that, right? But I think we can go a little deeper. I think that would be okay, right? But let's look at it more, more critically. So there's, there is cultural and literary layers of a promise here. So seeing the serpent not only as a villain, but in the broader symbolic space of the ancient world. Serpent in, in other ancient Near East writings represents chaos. Uh, it represents temptation, and it also could represent wisdom, er, earthly wisdom in other writings. So it's nuanced, right? It, it carries more than just this straightforward, this is the devil, 
So there's more to that. Also, a critical scholar would look at this text on its own, and they can't, with integrity in, in their discipline, they can't read that the serpent is anything other than a talking serpent. They can't read that it is the devil. They can't read that it is anything other than a talking serpent because that's the, that's the lane that critical scholarship has to stay in. Right? And, and this is why I think it's impossible, but they keep trying. Don't, don't hear me wrong. Critical scholarship is very useful, and people who do Bible study and hermeneutics, we, do, we use that element all the time. But, but critical scholarship that's seeking to separate the Bible from the theology, when they do that, they are making, in that moment, a theological decision. And so their, their desire to stay pure and not influenced by a theology is a theological decision to omit theology from a clearly spiritual text. And when they start to do that and they start to ask questions of the Bible that it's not trying to answer, and then they hold up this red flag and say, it's got this flaw, it's got this... The Bible, remember, the Bible isn't trying to answer questions of what and how. It's trying to answer the questions of who, who's God? Who, who's, who am I? Who are we? What's our relationship and why? What is God's intent and purpose? What is our purpose? What is our intent? Those are the spiritual elements that clearly this religious text is trying to address. It's not trying... Because if it was trying to answer how and why, it sucks at it. It does a terrible job. And so what we get is this, these arguments hurled against our faith based on critical scholarship when they have nothing to do it. But I always like to use this phrase. When we're looking at Genesis 1 and 2, there's these two different creation stories. And within the evangelical world, there's been this, this adamant legalistic conviction that everything in that has to be literal, and you have to believe it. It's all literal. Like this, these, two, these were the two, two first humans. They were da 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 and they're literal, and yeah, there's questions, right? If these were the first two humans, and then they had two sons, and one of them died, and then Cain went off to a land with his wife, wait a minute, we don't have a wife yet. And then Cain was going to go off to land and he was going to be afraid of being persecuted because he killed Abel. Abel, who are the people that were going to persecute him, right? And so we have to suspend logic to, to accept this is the clear, definitive, and literal story. So let's take the critical scholarship and look at the this, this interaction with the ser- serpent, and we see that there's these dimensions of meaning. And the thing I always like to say is the story of creation, the story of, of Eve crushing the head of the serpent, right? That, that's a symbol of, of Eve's descendant crushing the head of the serpent is this symbol of the authority, the intent, the purpose of what the serpent is doing is going to be crushed by the existence and being of the descendant of Eve. Right? And there's some really fascinating things in there, but the thing I always like to say is it's at least a myth. And, and don't hear myth as in a made-up story. Myth is an objective word that just means lore from a long time ago that has a meaning to it, that has a purpose to it. So the text is at least symbolic. And it could be literal because God's God. I don't know. We don't know if it's literal. But So arguing that is useless because our function in reading the text through the confessional lens is how does this shape me today. And that's where we can see that I am Adam and I am Eve, and sometimes I'm the serpent, and sometimes, right? And so we don't have to fear these types of assertions 
Because you'll find that if you lean into them, you realize it's truer than true. It's truer than factual. That might be a better better way to say it. So let's look at this proto-evangelium specifically. So you have Eve, uh, the descendant of Eve, or the seed of Eve, your your version might say, and there's something interesting there. Uh, The seed of Eve. That word seed, first of all, is seed. So women don't have a seed. So why? That's interesting. And there's never been an, a, uh, another biblical illustration about the seed of a woman. So that's interesting. But then when I think it through, I go, well, if Mary was a virgin, Jesus' conception was not from the seed of a man. So maybe there's something to that. That's interesting, right? And then... It says that the, the word seed in Hebrew there uh, could be either plural or singular. And so if it's, and that's just honest, right? So w- if we look at it critically, we look at it and go, okay, what if it's plural? Well, if it's singular, I think we all know where that's going. It's a ref- direct referral to the person of Jesus. And that, that with his death on the cross and Uh, victory in the resurrection. He had victory over the the sin and separation from God that sin creates. And that is true. But what if it's plural? And this is typically how uh, the Hebrew interpretation of this has been as a plural, and that the seed represents God's people. God's chosen ones, the nation of Israel. Uh, if If you look at it that way, you go, okay, the seed, plural, of Eve is, is God's people that he created. And, and we as God's people have victory over temptation and sin and death. We know that we have victory over those things because of Jesus Christ and what he did. And there's a case to be made by, by stating that it's not merely that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave that saves us. It's that when we depend on that, it transforms us into a new creation where our old life is gone and we have a new life and we have the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and where the, the, the heart of Christ or Christ's spirit dwells in our hearts, right? And we live and walk in victory. We are not merely saved. We are empowered to be saved. And our agency in our own salvation is real because it's fueled by the Holy Spirit through our faith in Christ. So whether or not the word seed is plural or singular doesn't change what I believe. As a matter of fact, if it's plural, it's way more empowering for me today because it, 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 it rightfully includes me as having a role or or not a role in salvation, but a a role to play in my sanctification. Like, I'm not just left to, you know, sit back and say, Jesus, just do whatever you want and let me know when you're done, right? We wrestle with our faith and our sin. And so we don't have to be afraid of whether it's singular or plural because we still see Jesus. Jesus. And they both could be true. And then specifically dealing with the serpent, I mentioned that you know the, the critical scholarship would just say, hey, it's a serpent. We see from texts from Revelation and a few other uh, uh, Old Testament prophecies make a referral back to the, this serpent of old. Or, right? And we see the connection that that could be referring to the Proto-Evangelion. And, and some of those, the way it talks about the serpent, does it personifies the serpent as the devil or Satan. But whether it actually does or not doesn't take away from the power of this message 
in that in all of creation, God creates things in the first day with such intentionality and order. And then we get a different creation story in, in chapter two that's focused specifically on Adam and Eve and their story and their narrative and the beauty of their garden and then their fall and their sin. And then built into the consequence of their sin is this promise of redemption. And so what we take away from that is built into God's design for mankind is that we would be saved. We are savable. So you and I go through life, we, do, we, we accept Jesus maybe, or we try to be a good person, and we fail. And our path to being restored, to partaking in the crushing of the intent of the serpent, which his intent is to separate us from God. That's the representation in this whole story. Right? And, and, and you don't have to look too far to see, yeah, that makes sense. Separating us from anyone feels like guilt and shame and hiding, which is exactly what Adam and Eve did. Right? When we've offended someone and we're afraid to confront them or if we failed someone or if we forgot to turn in a paper, we don't want to go to school. Right? Uh, those types of things are separating us from relationship. And so we see that in there and then built into that is redemption and the hope of being unified with God again. That's God's design. Like our failure is built into God's plan. So the serpent at least represents the thing that separates us from God and God has a plan to have victory over it. So whether or not the serpent is the embodiment of the devil and whatever that even means is irrelevant because that statement is truer than factual. Because it breathes life. And because it breathes life, it fits in the category of scripture that is God breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and righteousness. So in the light of Genesis 3.15 and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, either directly or as our Savior, plural or singular, we are invited to a moment to make a decision every day. The decision, will I choose to be God's people? And that's the other thing that the story of Genesis 1 through 3 reveals is God has given, he loves us and respects us so much, he gives us the choice to follow him. The way we've said that in Christian history in the last few decades is that we accept Jesus into our heart. We repent of our sins. And I would say that is not inaccurate. I would say it's not complete the way we kind of boiled that down to this catchy phrase. But when we decide and we realize that we are Adam and Eve in this story, we are the people of God in the whole narrative of the Old Testament, and we say, I am going to be, I'm going to fulfill my role as, as a person of God. I'm going to answer, I'm going to follow that means I'm going to obey in the most beautiful way because I trust the one giving, giving the law. I trust the one that's, that's telling me how to live and how to serve and how to control my heart and, and how to be selfless and kind and faithful and, and self-controlled. Like he's, I trust him, so I'm gonna wrestle with the part of me that wants to eat the apple. Wasn't really an apple too, that's another etymology thing, but, and it's irrelevant whether it was an apple or not. <laughs> so I shouldn't have said that, and then I shouldn't keep talking right now, because I'm rabbit trailing. And, and I, I guess I say this all this way because this is the reason why this is called the first gospel. Because it's an invitation to accept the way God designed the world, that we have agency and he loves us, and he wants us to choose to love him, and sometimes we choose to not love him. And there is no separating love of God and obedience. 
Obedience to God is to love God, and to love God is to obey. And he knows that we sin. And he knows that we fall away. And he's built redemption into his plan, and we call that Jesus. I was talking to Eric between services, and we were talking about the nature of sin. And uh, it's interesting that in the, the, the Jewish sacrificial system of of mikvah and baptism and cleansing to be before God and do something holy and forgiveness of sin, there is, uh, there's animal sacrifices for uncleanliness and those types of things, but the wage of willful disobedience, there is no sacrifice for. The wage of willful disobedience is death. So without God designing the proto-evangelion, the redemption of victory over the serpent into creation, the Bible would be two pages and none of us would be here to read it. Right? It would be, and Adam and Eve ate of the tree and they died. And so when we realize that we are the sin, we, am, we are the sinners, how do we, get, how do we receive redemption? Well, we believe that Jesus is the seed of Eve. Or we believe we are the seed of Eve saved by Jesus. Either way, it results in the same thing. We are restored back unto God in righteousness, forgiven and free, regardless of our past, regardless of how many times we failed. Forgiveness is right there, and we can be set free. But I I encourage you that as we go this week, that you take this moment, this opportunity to reaffirm and, and acknowledge that you are God's people. You're here to do God's work for God's purposes. And the enemy is gonna try to deceive you and make you think that because of your failure, you're not God's people anymore. And that's not true. So we claim this first gospel that We're forgiven, we're free, and the way to live that way is to believe it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your gospel. Thank you that you remind us all throughout the Bible that we are your people, that you love us, that you pursue us, and that you, in your design, have created our own redemption path. And God, we choose it. I choose it in the name of Jesus through the power of the resurrection. I choose to follow you and enjoy intimacy with you and enjoy closeness. God be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen.